I'd like to introduce you to today's speaker, Lisa DiChiara. She is the Director of Advocacy for Landmarks Illinois. She's been in this role since 2003. She was previously the organization's Director of Chicago Programs from 94 to 97. As Director of Advocacy, Lisa is on the front line of all calls for assistance on preservation issues from Landmarks Illinois members and the public and manages Landmarks Illinois major advocacy initiatives in the Chicagoland area including condition, reuse, and feasibility studies for threatened historic buildings. She also administers the statewide most endangered historic places program. Her resume goes on and on with amazing projects that she's been involved with. I'm not gonna share the whole thing with you, um, but she has amazing experience in this area. She also has a bachelor's in um, art and architectural history from UCLA and a master's degree in historic preservation from the University of Pennsylvania. So Lisa, welcome to our webinar. Thank you, thanks for having me. And it's nice to be back, even though it's virtually and not in person. Absolutely. So I'm going to um, turn off my camera and my microphone. I'll be still monitoring the chat. I'm gonna turn things over to you, Lisa, and then I'll be back for Q&A. Great, thank you, Roz. And again, thank you all. And uh, it's really nice to be here this afternoon with all of you. Um, I am really uh, happy to talk to you about this project that Landmarks Illinois has initiated. And uh, the focus is documenting women architects, as Roz said, but also uh, in our project, we have other women professions such as engineering, landscape architecture, and uh, developer and also client, speaking of the Farnsworth House. Uh, Edith Farnsworth is a very famous client that you'll learn more about from Lee Bay and Scott and Happy, which will be a terrific talk. Um, what I want to do is just give you um, a snapshot of our program. And you may be familiar with Landmarks Illinois. And by the way, the reason I have this very, um, vintage funky logo behind me is because we are actually celebrating our 50th anniversary this year and so this logo is our 70s vintage logo <laughs> so the reason you may be more familiar with landmarks illinois is because of our annual most endangered historic places list and it was in 2017 that on that list we included the Rotunda building at Chicago's O'Hare Airport, as you see pictured here. The building was built in 1962, and the reason we included this building on our list was because of the ongoing gate and terminal expansion plans for the airport and the uncertainty of the Rotunda's future. This innovative 1962 round building built between O'Hare's first terminals has remained largely intact. It was designed by Gertrude Lemp Kerbis, who at the time was with the powerhouse firm of CF Murphy Associates, which was responsible for O'Hare Airport's overall design and planning. As lead architect for the rotunda, Kerbis distinguished it by its round shape and the use of cable and concrete roof truss system. But even more remarkable is that Kerbis was given the lead design role as she was one of few women working in the field, which as we know, was male dominated. The rotunda's interior has a balcony that wraps around an open two-story atrium with a central crisscross staircase. Many may remember the building as having housed the famed Seven Continents Restaurant, a fine dining establishment in the midst of the bustling airport from where diners could watch airplanes take off and land. Today, the interior is mostly used as a pass-through between terminals, but is intact. And the Illinois State Historic Preservation Office has determined the building is eligible for listing in the National Register of Historic Places. Lisa, you know what? I'm just getting a couple of comments that this, they wish the microphone on you was a little bit louder. Okay. So if you could maybe be a little closer or speak, that would be great. Thank you for telling me, Roz. Is this better? I think so, yes, thanks. Okay. Yeah. So speaking of Jeannie Gang, fortunately, as seen in the rendering here by Studio Gang, Jeannie Gang's firm for the new global terminal, 
The building is included in current plans. You can see it just to the left. But details are yet to be seen, and we continue to advocate for this important building as it needs to be protected, preferably as a Chicago designated landmark. In making that case, we started to explore Kerbis's other built works, including the Skokie Public Library, which she designed while at Skidmore, Owings, and Merrill, and was built in 1960. And the greenhouse condominiums at 2131 North Clark in Chicago, built in 1976, in which her role was both architect and developer. In talking with Gertrude's daughter, Kim, her mother at this point in her career, now with her own firm, Lemp Kerbis, was just making ends meet between teaching at Harper Community College and finding clients. So in this case, becoming developer was more of a necessity. As Gertrude stated in her 2007 oral history interview for the Department of Architecture and Design at the Art Institute of Chicago, quote, if the client doesn't come to you, you have to make your own client, unquote. At the greenhouse with a loan from architect Ted Bennett, and others, she bought the land, designed the project, worked as construction manager, and built this AIA award-winning project, as seen here featured in Progressive Architecture Magazine in 1976. And to your right is a view of the building at night. And yet, despite her accomplished career, you can see that this is the type of media coverage Gertrude received. In addition to Kerbis's built legacy, we began to research the work of other female architects in Chicago and the region, who we believe have never been adequately recognized. The survey earlier proves that point. But soon we realized that like Kerbis's work also as a developer, this was not just about the need to recognize female architects, but also engineers, landscape architects, interior designers, developers, and clients who have not been adequately recognized for their impact on the built legacy of Illinois. In researching women who designed and built places, we came to realize too that in Chicago, our great city of architecture, there is not one building designed or developed by a woman that is designated a Chicago landmark, and therefore, protected. And as you can see, we have a lot of designated landmarks in Chicago and many by these very recognizable men. So we have set out to change this. And in 2018, with the help of our young professionals group, the Skyline Council, and particularly one of its most active volunteers, Erica Rogero, with architect firm McGuire Agleski in Evanston, we made this research an official project and decided to expand our focus to include not only the work of women in Chicago, but in the entire state from 1879 to 1979. And as we find these built places in Illinois, we will be ultimately evaluating their condition and eligibility for designation, either as local landmarks, depending on their location, or for listing in the National Register of Historic Places. While we had been quietly working on this effort for over two years, we thought it fitting to officially launch Women Who Built Illinois in 2020 to celebrate the 100th anniversary of the passage of the 19th Amendment. And it is our plan by later this spring to have this database officially housed on our website for the public to access and contribute to, as we know more women's stories and places in the state will be found. So today I am only presenting you with a sampling of the 90 plus groundbreaking women we have assembled in our database to date, who were pioneers in the fields of architecture, engineering, landscape design, and real estate starting in the early 20th century and from across the state of Illinois. Beginning here with Elizabeth Martini, the first woman to be a sole owner of an architecture firm in Chicago. Elizabeth was born in Brooklyn, New York in 1886 and grew up in Massachusetts. 
She studied at the Pratt Institute and Columbia University before moving with her family to Illinois in 1909. In her first year, she was rejected by 90 architectural firms due to her gender until finding a position as a secretary. In 1913, she received her architectural license from the state of Illinois, only the second woman ever licensed in the state, and the following year opened her own practice. Elizabeth practiced under her initials A, excuse me, E. A. Martini, assuming that she would receive more inquiries if she did not use her name Elizabeth, even before referring to being referred to as a he in the in the trivium. Elizabeth continued her practice in Chicago until 1934, at which time she moved to Bangor, Michigan. While in Chicago, Martini ran a newspaper adver advertisement in hopes of meeting other women in the field, and it read, quote, only girl architect lonely, to meet all the women architects in Chicago to form a club, unquote. And in 1921, she founded the Chicago Drafting Club, one of the first organizations for women architects and a precursor of the Women's Architectural Club founded in 1927. Many of Martini's works were for single family residences across the Chicagoland area. She was one of three winners of a 1917 farmhouse design competition sponsored by the Illinois Board of, Art of Agriculture and the Illinois chapter of the AIA and regularly contributed articles to Better Homes and Gardens magazine. In addition to her residential designs, Martini was responsible for the design of a few factories and warehouses like the A. Alexander Bauer Construction Company at 230 West Superior in Chicago, as well as religious works, including her prominent design for St. Luke's Lutheran Congregation in Park Ridge. Next, we have Juliet Alice Petal. Currently, we know very little about Petal. While her career in Indiana is well documented, her work and time in Illinois is not as well known. Born in 1899 in Terre Haute, Indiana, Petal learned how to draft at an early age from her father who taught machine design. She graduated from the University of Michigan in 1922 and was also one of the co-founders of the Women's Architectural Club. After graduation, she moved to Chicago where she worked for a number of architectural firms including Perkins, Fellows, and Hamilton and the office of Edwin Hill Clark. During the Great Depression, she worked as a drafts person with the Historic American Building Survey, and she moved back to Terre Haute in 1935, where she opened her own architectural firm and practiced for the next 30 years. Her only two known works in Illinois are two residences located in the Oak Crest subdivision in Marshall, Illinois. Built in the late 1950s, one of those images is seen here. Petal was also known for her drawings and holiday cards, a few which are featured at the top of the slide. Born in Shanghai, China, Ho Hu Xiao began her architectural studies and career in her home country, first studying at the National Central University in Taiwan and receiving her bachelor's in architecture in 1941 and then going on to teach at the university from 1941 to 1946. Shao moved to the United States in 1949 after being awarded the Barber Scholarship for Oriental Women by the University of Michigan, a scholarship awarded to outstanding women with intent that they would work at the University of Michigan and that study at the University of Michigan and then return to their home countries with the knowledge and skills they obtained to better the lives of those who lived there. Shao never returned home though, and formally immigrated to the United States in 1952 after graduating and worked in the architectural firm of William Edward, Edward Cap in Detroit between 1949 and 1952. Shao moved to Chicago by 1958 and joined the firm of Lobel, Schlossman and Bennett, where she remained for a majority of her career designing buildings across the Midwest. In Illinois, her significant works focused on private residential like the Saul Sherman residence in Winneka, 
educational projects, including Mather High School and Deerfield High School, for which she won an award from the American Association of School Administrators in 1961, recreational buildings like the Harriet Harris Park District Building in Chicago, as well as healthcare facilities and offices. Outside of Illinois, she had educational commissions from Beloit College in Wisconsin and private residential, including the Winton Place apartment building in Lakewood, Ohio. Next is Georgia Louise Harris Brown. Considered to be the second African American woman to become a licensed architect in the United States. Brown was born in Topeka, Kansas in 1918. And from an early age, she showed an artistic and mechanical aptitude while working on cars and farm equipment with her older brothers. In 1938, she went to visit her brother in Chicago and attended a summer course at IIT, taught by Mies van der Rohe. Between 1940 and 1944, she attended the University of Kansas to receive a degree in architecture, becoming the first African-American woman to earn the degree in the history of the university. Brown returned to Chicago in 1945 and began working at the architectural firm of Kenneth Roderick O'Neill, where she stayed until 1949. That year, she received her architectural license and then took a job with Frank Kornacker and Associates. She is seen here in a sea of men at the Kornacker office. Later, Brown learned to speak Portuguese by studying with a friend and permanently moved to Brazil in 1954, not returning stateside until 1995. One of her reasons for leaving the United States was because, quote, opportunities for advancement were limited by her race, unquote. And in Brazil, there would be fewer racial boundaries for her to succeed. While working in Chicago, Brown was responsible for the structural calculations on a number of prominent buildings constructed in the 1940s and the 1950s, including the Promontory Apartments, 860 880 Lakeshore Drive, both designed by Mies van der Rohe, as well as the Prairie Court Apartments by Keck and Keck. We also have chosen in our database to include landscape architects, starting with pioneer landscape architect and designer Gertrude Eisendrath Camille Koo. Born in 1893 in Racine, Wisconsin, Gertrude moved to Chicago with her family at age six. As a young adult, she began her college education at Sweetbriar College in Virginia, and in 1912, transferred to the Lothrop School, Lothrop, excuse me, School of Landscape Architecture in Massachusetts, from which she graduated in 1917. While in school, Koo apprenticed with landscape architect Ellen Biddle Shipman before being then hired at the office of Francis Robinson in Des Moines, Iowa. As you can see, many women were establishing themselves in the field of landscape architecture more commonly during this period. She returned to Chicago in 1921 and started her own practice. Her first designs were for private gardens where she had family connections. Over the next 50 years, Ku designed over 400 landscaping projects and gardens, many of these with her associate, Mary Long Rogers. Ku's work focused on both plantings for new construction and redesigns of existing landscapes. Where many large estates through Chicago's North Shore suburbs were being subdivided into, su into smaller lots. In the 1930s, she designed several gardens for shoe manufacturer Irving, Irving Florsheim, especially his estate in Libertyville. She was so well established in 1940 that she was often hired before the project architect with the understanding that she would assist in choosing the architect of a home. By 1950, Ku was working with Rogers designing over 200 landscapes throughout their 25 plus year collaboration. 
Although most of her work was residential, Ku completed commissions for several hospitals and religious institutions, including Chicago's Children's Memorial Hospital. And here you can see a nice long list that we've assembled of many of the projects that Ku designed over the years in the Chicago suburban area, primarily. Before the architect, engineer, landscape designer, any of those professions, there is the developer. As part of this project, we have been able to identify a number of pioneering women developers, including Emma Kennett. An Illinois native, Kennett was born in February, 1891. We don't have much information on Kennett's first three decades of life, but by time she was 32, she was operating the Kennett Construction Company and building picturesque flat buildings in the Tudor and Spanish Revival styles across Chicago's far north side communities. Kennett designed all of her own buildings. We don't think she had an architectural license, but she took on this design role assisted only by local architects when in need for stamping drawings for the purpose of permitting. Some of those local architects included Arthur Bucket and Herbert, Herbert Richter. And again, to ensure that the technical details also were correct. As for a contractor, Kenneth partnered with one of the first African-American contractors in the city, Joseph Frederick Rousseau. Together, they did nearly $5 million in business over roughly five years, only splitting ways due to the Great Depression and a lull in the city's development activity. Despite all of this, Kennett persisted and is known to have constructed over 80 multi-unit homes in the Jarvis Ridge Howard area of Rogers Park, as well as in Evanston. And here on the right-hand side are two of her beautiful apartment buildings, which interestingly happened to be on my street where I live. So I photographed these over the summer and took walks by them all the time, and they are stunning buildings. She would also go on to establish later the Kennett Realty Company during the mid 20th century, building and selling model homes in the North Shore suburb of Lake Forest. Some addresses and a sample home seen here with some of her Rogers Park apartment buildings. So you can see some of these addresses and the house below. And if you are familiar with any of these homes, we hope you will let us know any history that you may be familiar with. By 1960, she moved to California and pursued a career as, a, as an innkeeper, interestingly. So now we realize we are not the only ones doing research and highlighting the accomplishments of women in the history of Illinois' built environment. Highland Park-based architectural historian, Susan Benjamin, has been studying the work of Greta Letterer, who built hundreds of homes in Highland Park and Glencoe from the 1950s and early 70s. As you can see here by this headline, however, <laughs> It's very interesting to see the way women were portrayed in the press, pursuing the field of men. Meet Greta, blonde builder of the suburbs. Greta went on, as I said, to build hundreds of homes in Highland Park and Glencoe. And despite the fact that in both of those suburbs, we do consistently see teardowns, especially of mid-century homes, her homes were so well designed and built that interestingly, many of her homes still remain and are sought after and enjoyed by their owners. And often when you see them in, their, in the real estate listings, they're actually marketed as having been designed and built by well-known designer and builder Greta Lederer. Chicago Women in Architecture, an organization co-founded by Gertrude Purvis, supports the work of women architects as a profession 
in Chicago. They will be sponsoring next month on April 13th, a panel discussion that I'll be participating in, as well as several others. And if you're still interested in this topic or know others who may be, I, I welcome you to go to Chicago Women in Architecture's website to sign up for that panel discussion on April 13th. And you can see here that their focus uh, will also be Elizabeth Martini, who um, uh, is, is, again, a, a wonderful person in our history and deserves to be better known for a reason other than a cocktail. Architectural historian Julia Bachrock has been featuring underrecognized women in lectures and on her blog. Her blog address is seen here. She's really done an incredible job of studying the work of Bertha Urix Whitman, who designed many single family homes in Evanston, including the one that you see on your screen. Also not long ago, our colleagues at the Chicago Bungalow Association discovered and highlighted the work of Mary Willis who even earlier than Kerbis designed and developed her own buildings, in this case, bungalows on the Northwest side in the 19 teens. And on the right, you can see a bungalow that was for sale about a year ago uh, that was featured in Crane's Chicago Business by Dennis Rodkin, that was built by Mary Willis. On the left, the National Trust for Historic Preservation and their historic site, the Farnsworth House, uh, is just wrapping up a, a wonderful uh, exhibition at the house that basically features the home the way it was furnished when Edith Farnsworth lived there. If any of you have visited the Farnsworth House before, um, you have most likely seen it furnished in its purest, most modernist sense. <laughs> sensibility the way Miss Vendero wanted it to always look, but that was due to Lord Palumbo, who was its second owner and did a pristine restoration of the house and furnished it in that very uh, minimalist way. When Edith Farnsworth lived in the, in the Farnsworth house, um, it looked more as you see it to the left, uh, a home that she could enjoy as a respite on the weekends from being a busy doctor. And uh, Ms. Renderow did not necessarily approve. <laughs> and it'll be interesting during Lee Bay and Scott Mahaffey's presentation to understand the way the home functioned for Edith. It's because of Edith's incredible role as probably one of the most famous clients in the state uh, that we've decided to include clients in our Women Who Built Illinois database as well. If it wasn't for Edith Farnsworth, we wouldn't have the Farnsworth House, um, arguably one of the most famous single family modern homes ever built in the nation. So we're continuing to look for information on many women. These women that you see listed here are women that we're looking to uh, find more information. If any of you are familiar with their names, with the communities they may have worked in, or know of any uh, places or schools that they attended, organizations, um, you know, often we find that information comes to us by circumstance. And, um, you know, where someone may have gone to church with that person, someone's child may have been raised with that person's child. So uh, we're really looking for information to be brought to us because uh, just too often women were not documented nor their work. And so it really is like starting all over. Um, as we mentioned, uh, as I mentioned earlier with Elizabeth Martini who used her first initials to market her firm. A lot of times when we're searching for these women they may have been using um, different names or initials and not their full name. So then again, sometimes it's hard to find the information on them that we need. I'll end with this funny comic from 1979 from the magazine Progressive Architecture. And you can see in 1979, uh, Progressive Architecture decided to do 
um, a story about the role of women in architecture and um, the growth of the profession for women in the field. Um, it was still very much uh, being stereotyped that women, if they were going to be designers, that unlike Gertrude Kerbis, who was designing a, a major building at O'Hare Airport, um, that women were doing just sweet small houses um, in the colonial or Georgian styles. Um, so as you can see here in the comic on the right, why yes, I am a little homemaker. I'm in the construction business and I build small homes. Lastly, I want to acknowledge the funders of our initiative. And uh, we're so grateful to them for their support. So not only the National Trust for Historic Preservation and AIA Illinois and Women in Restoration and Engineering, but also Kim Kerbis, who is the proud daughter of Gertrude Lemp Kerbis. Also here is our website, landmarks.org. Uh, at our website, you can find more information about this initiative under our programs tab. And again, it is later in the spring that we hope to have the database of our 90 plus women up and running. And lastly, here is my contact information, because again, if any of you are familiar with any women that you think we need to know about, uh, this is my email and our phone number. Uh, the other thing I want to remind everyone is, again, our period of focus right now is 1879 to 1979. And the reason for that is because thinking about the National Register of Historic Places thinking about most local landmarking programs, um, usually it is uh, more standard to consider buildings for landmark protection if they are at least 50 years old. So that puts us really to buildings that are right now in, in the late 60s period, but we gave, we gave ourselves sort of that buffer decade to go to 1979. Um, there is still the, ability to bring buildings into the National Register of Historic Places, even if they're younger than 50, but you have to prove exceptional significance. Um, we absolutely are thrilled that Jeannie Gang continues to be as recognized as she is. She's not in our survey because she's a current woman in the profession. Um, so anyway, that's just to make that clarification point for everyone. So I am, again, really happy that I was able to present this to you today. I wanted to keep it to a half hour so that we had plenty of time to have discussion. I hope Thank you, Lisa. You're welcome. Yeah, and, and I, one of the things I'm finding so interesting about this project is that you're really still soliciting input from the public on that list, those list of women that you don't have quite enough information on. So it'd be so exciting if someone, I'm sure, was able to provide you with a clue or information about one of them. So again, it's really interesting because, um, I, you know, many women that we are focused on were active in the suburbs. Uh, like I said, Greta Letterer in the North Shore. There's a woman named Jean Wareheim who was very, very active in Lombard. Um, we uh, definitely know, uh, again, Gertrude Kerbis, when she went on to do uh, work under her own firm, Len Kerbis, she was actually responsible for designing the buildings, some may remember if you're from the North Shore, on the Highland Park Tennis Club, in addition to the Skokie Public Library. So um, many women uh, with accomplished careers doing a lot of work in the suburbs. And so again, these women were part of the community where they lived uh, or had their offices. And so it's not uncommon for us to hear from people to say, she was my neighbor, she was someone whose kids went to my kids' school. Um, and often that is the best type of um, history we can collect are people's oral histories, recollections, also sometimes personal photographs because we always think about professionally taken photographs of buildings uh, by the famous architectural architecture firm, uh, photography firm Hedrick Blessing, um, or firms would hire professional photographers. A lot of times we're collecting photographs of people through their personal uh, relationships with them, uh, even if it's on a job site. You know, if someone was commissioned to design a house, 
someone from the family may have been out there photographing it, mm -hmm. being built or a neighbor. And that's the kind of uh, material that's really priceless that we love. Wow. Well, good. I hope you continue to find more people to add to your database. I should mention that, you know, the reason why we we're offering this month at this time, though it's always an interesting topic, is that March is Women's History Month. So well, that this is just in the nick of time, being the 31st. Right, exactly. Mm -hmm. <laughs> exactly. We're just in time. Mm -hmm. So that was kind of one of the reasons why we're offering it now and just a good example of women's history. Um, I should mention, I know we asked in the earlier whether anyone was familiar with a female architect. And of course, someone mentioned Jeannie Gang and also Carol Ross Barney. Yes. So Carol Ross Barney is uh, a wonderful person and um, very, very involved in Chicago women in architecture and um, still active today, uh, still has her own firm and um, responsible for so many incredible uh, achievements, especially in the city of Chicago and especially uh, with um, the built environment as it relates to even our park system. Um, and uh, she uh, is definitely inc included in our um, database because she started her profession previous to 1979. She's been around for a long time, but, but thank you for bringing her up. It's nice to hear another name. Lisa, would you say, I don't know if you can comment on this, but in general, um, is, is the world of architecture kind of becoming more friendly to, like, to women? I mean, is that, do you, could you comment on that at all? Sure. Um, I served for over a decade on AIA Chicago's foundation board. And one of the roles we have at the foundation is to give scholarships uh, to architecture students. And um, I, I would say that in over my decade of participating on that board and reviewing applications for scholarships uh, and the various programs that they administer, um, the percentage of women that we saw coming through the major architecture schools like IIT, um, University of Illinois, uh, Chicago, also um, School of the Art Institute has an architecture program, um, you know, has been increasing. Absolutely more and more women are now entering the field. And, um, you know, I'd say the area where I feel like we're still lacking um, women, and this is really reflective in our database, is in engineering. Mm. Um, we do have certainly a lot of women who are engineers today, but in this database of women that we've collected over that 100 year period of 1879 to 1979, very few engineers. Um, Georgia Louise Harris Brown. Um, even though she had an architecture degree, she technically was an engineer. I mean, she was really doing those um, structural calculations, like I said, and uh, really she studied engineering and she just didn't have the official you know, degree. Mm -hmm. um, so that is an area that still, I think is a tough nut to crack for a lot of women and uh, will continue to hopefully uh, change as, as we move forward. Oh, interesting. Okay. Well, I think, um, I don't know if you have any more questions. Someone was asking about, are any of the women alive? I suppose that you feature in your database, but are there some that are still living now? Well, yes, um, it, but um, you raised the good point. I mean, for a lot of these women who are of the mid, who were, whose careers were really during that mid-century period, you know, the 50s, the 60s. I mean, Carol Ross Barney, as we said, is still living um, and very active, thankfully. But Gertrude Kerbis, Gertrude only died a couple of years ago. Mm -hmm. um, and thank, thankfully, um, had really gotten a lot of incredible recognition toward the end of her life, both by um, AIA Chicago with a Lifetime Achievement Award um, she also had been, there's a wonderful oral history interview of her that anyone can find um, that was done as part of the oral history project at the Art Institute of Chicago. Um, and, you know, the, the fact is, I mean, you know, as, as these women um, enter their, their 80s and their 90s, we're, we're, yeah, we're, we're, they won't be with us much longer. So Gertrude only died just several years ago. 
Yeah, it's really impressive. Some of those women that you feature and they went to these universities at a time when you can't even imagine that they were even like enrolled, let alone pursuing a degree in those fields. It's Yeah, like, and you know, it's interesting because, um, you know, I think I, I think of all the schools in Illinois, IIT uh, was the one that was probably considered the most diverse and progressive, um, not only with women being in the program, but um, minorities, so, you know, people of all races and international students as well. And, um, uh, but, but it is interesting, and um, I, I'm not saying this as, as a biased person, because I happen to be from Michigan, and I have one son at University of Michigan and another going there in the fall. <laughs> but University of Michigan had a lot of women in their architecture program. And um, you all may have seen um, in, in my presentation that several women were from University of Michigan. And, uh, you know, as still happens today, a lot of people from Michigan migrate to Chicago is the closest. As place. myself, I went to Michigan, I'm from Detroit, and I landed here. <laughs> I am too, Roz. We have something new to talk about. <laughs> um, and and um, the woman that Frank Lloyd Wright had his relationship with, um, who was the woman that he kind of built his homes for? And um, I can't find her name right now, but she was oh, featured. Oh, yeah. And, yeah, everyone likes the gossip. <laughs> yeah. Anyhow, I know she's I know she's a Michigan grad as well. <laughs> yeah, um, and some people may be familiar with the name Marion Mahoney Griffin. Mm -hmm. And Marion Mahoney Griffin probably is one of the most famous um, Chicago female architects um, who really did have her career uh, for many years in Frank Lloyd Wright's office, where she met her husband, um, Walter Burley Griffin. Um, and, you know, she is acknowledged as being um, responsible for the design and uh, the, the drawings of many, many right missions that right is, a, you know, is, is basically um, uh, credited for and not, and not her, but, you know, under deep study, you see her name, her, her name on the drawings, but she definitely is a well-known name and then mostly because she and her husband went on uh later to have their own firm together and of course moved to australia and are responsible for designing the city plan of the capital chamber out there in australia and so most famous for that um but then she returned to chicago later living on the again rogers park neighborhood there's a park named for her today um, but does but died uh, sort of a a woman of modest means. So you know, after having this very very successful career, um, really did not um, have you know much money at the end of her life and lived very humbly. Well, I just love this project, and I'm so glad that you can't able to share it with us today. And just thank you for your time and putting this together for us. Really. We love the opportunity to kind of highlight projects like this. So thank you, Lisa, for joining oh, us. Oh, you're welcome. And again, please, um, anyone reach out to me. Again, you see my email, my phone number. Uh, we're welcome to get, uh, we look forward to getting information from anyone who may have it to contribute to our database. And everyone, thank you for joining us from home. We hope you've enjoyed today's presentation. We hope to see you again soon. And um, have a good day, everyone. Bye-bye. <laughs> thank you.